and I finally get to Spurgeon, I'm like, all right, we did it again. We got them all done. <laughs> when I, today, I was uh, writing on the internet and I was answering a question that I posed, really, but other people I know have asked it, but like, why, you know, what, what is this evotional, you know, I mean, everybody's got an evotional, that's just a devotion that's on the internet, you know, that we use the E language in order to describe the community of internet as well as digital information, you know, it's just popular, but for me it was a combination of not just the internet, but the emotion of devotion, you know, as that I wanted to put that back in of how the reality of how I survived my life, you know, for 35 plus years by reading these, you know, and clinging to them, you know, as it were, you know, hinged upon almost every word that proceeded, you know, from the mouth of God, either by Bible or by devotion or by, you know, hearing or by seeing and witnessing the circumstances of my life as they came together. And God developed me into participating with him in a relationship. Didn't that sound all really sophisticated? <laughs> so anyways, I was writing it, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there's eight devotionals that I'm doing every day? Oh, what was I thinking? And then I I laughed because then I went, oh, but you know, I better put down where they're at. So I put down all these four or five different locations that they're posted on, and then I went, Oh, yeah, what about the blogs? And I was like, okay, all the blogs that they're on. And I went, oh, yeah, what about the posts that are on the pages? Yeah, I put all those down. And you know, when I looked at it, I went, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know, when you're a prolific writer, you know, and you write a lot, it isn't that burdensome, you know, it isn't that challenging in a way, you know, is that it just comes naturally. I mean, it just, for me, I... I have about 60 blogs, and I run five networks, and, well, I probably run seven networks, but basically five that I'm taking credit for. <laughs> and the fun part is to be able to have, like, a news network or a theological network or a biblical network or a devotional network or a, um, I like to say a questioning network, which is just simply Christian issues. Or even my own personal network that, you know, I don't get as much time to develop as much as I'd like to in my writing projects and my books and my, my uh, chapter style chat books, or my chapter books and my chat books. But even in all of those, it's so much fun to be able to just put it out there, you know, and to see it as well as others respond to it and interact with God by way of something that He's laid on your heart to inspire someone else with. And I think I like that, you know, is to see how God works in you as well with your abilities and your capability to either, you know, make a video or write a book or, you know, click on a like, you know, on the internet to tell someone about some picture you found or some little piece of information that I hope isn't just a tabloid, you know, gossip rumor thing, because I see so many of those, it's crazy nowadays how much people will believe in something that's completely false but I enjoy when it is that people share that something personal to them with it that touches their heart that reveals who they are in Jesus and then how Jesus took them through it and how they have something now to care for someone else too and I love seeing that you know it just thrills me to death because it it reminds me that as much as people want to say there's no hope, the reality is God has his people everywhere. They're just interspersed like salt to be used for his purpose when he needs them. And they keep literally the world together. Because once it's gone, it's over. <laughs> That's it. Eh, this world is going to go to pieces. <laughs> That's obvious. They don't know what they're doing. You know, whether you talk about economy or politics or... or oh gosh, uh, military or anything, you know, societal or ethical or morality, they don't know what they're doing. You know, God does, but obviously people don't. So I just smile when I see how those that call upon the Lord and have a personal relationship with Him exemplify 
what God can do in a life that's committed to Him and that's willing to just simply admit that they're not perfect, but God is still using them anyways, and they just go forward and do the best they can. And that's all you and I are required to do is spend a little time with Jesus. You know, there's this old song says something about spend a little time with Jesus. You know, it's kind of like a da-da-da-da-da. And that's really all you got to do. You know, spend a little time with Jesus in the morning. You know, he'll talk to you if you let him, <laughs> if you could get in the word in edgewise. But my thought is when I was telling everyone about emotional was if we can learn to listen and really focus in on that priority that God said we could have Him speak to us audibly, physically, and personally, then to me that would cause us to want to do whatever it is He wants us to do. For instance, like maybe you need to go to church, maybe you need to do more involved in ministry there, or maybe you need to you know, be involved with your family, you know, and to restore a relationship, or whatever it is that God inspires in you and conspires in your life to bring you to a place of knowing Him better. He's going to tell you that, that that's what's hindering you from hearing Him. And so that was why I said, you know, I'm emotional, that my goal is that you hear God, period. Hear God speak audibly. And I know in order to get there, He's going to <laughs> clean up your act somewhat, because you might have something stuck in your ear, you know, like your finger, you know, and once he takes that out, it's easier to hear. So, in emotionals, that's what they do, is they remind us of the things we might not think of every day, because we only spend one day in church, or two or three. So, with your devotional, I pray that God is speaking to you as much as he is to me, which, boy, sometimes it's like, wow, he ain't speaking, he's shouting, <laughs> and I got it loud and clear. But in Spurgeon, in summer and in winter shall it be. The streams of living water which flow from Jerusalem are not dried up by parching heaps of sultry midsummer any more than they were frozen by the cold winds of blustering winter. Rejoice, O my soul, that thou art spared to testify of the faithfulness of the Lord. The seasons change, and thou changest, but thy Lord abides evermore the same, and the streams of his love are as deep and as broad and as full as ever. The heaps of business cares and scorching trials make me need the cooling influences of the river of his grace. I may go at once and drink to the full from the inexhaustible fountain, for in summer and in winter it pours forth its flood. The upper springs are never scanty, and blessed be the name of the Lord that the nether springs cannot fail either. Elijah, Eliah, found Cherith dry up, but Jehovah was still the same God of providence. Job said his brethren were like deceitful brooks, but he found his God an overflowing river of consolation. The Nile is the great confidence of Egypt, but its floods are variable. Our Lord is evermore the same. By turning the course of the Euphrates, Cyrus took the city of Babylon. But no power, human or infernal, can divert the current of divine grace. The tracks of ancient rivers have been found, all dry and desolate. But the streams with which there rise on the mountains of divine sovereignty and infinite love shall never be full to the brim. Generations melt away, but the course of grace is unaltered. The river of God may be sing. The river of God may sing with greater truth than the brook in the poem. Men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. How happy art thou, O soul, to be led beside such still waters! Never wander to other streams, lest thou hear the Lord rebuke. Why hast thou to do the way of Egypt to drink of the muddy river? You know, it's funny. It's like <laughs> you get to listen to a articulation, and you know a flamboyant style with which Spurgeon creates this world that you see with using the scriptural words to bring them into the modern era of his day with the personification of each individual aspect of what the Bible says that the Word of God is, which is the stream of living waters that would flow out of us and that we could 
immerse ourselves in the river that comes from his throne, which is grace. And so he points and pictures a perfect, beautiful scenario that flows with the Elizabethan articulations of words that we might not use nowadays. But the bottom line is, you know, we used to say, it's a splunk, splunk, dunk, dunk, and you just dive on in to grace, <laughs> you know, because we just want to get splashed, you know. Come on, let's dive in. Do you remember, have you ever seen a movie called Godspell or heard about it? And at the very beginning, there's a beautiful fountain in New York, of course, because its setting is New York. And you have the person who's symbolic of John the Baptist there, and he's bringing the people, and they get splashed, and they go, I want to get cleaned up, you know, and they splashed. And that's what happens is that the next scene you see Jesus with the big S on his chest, you know, and he comes up and he says, I want to get cleaned up. And he says, then John goes into his famous routine of, you know, whoa, I need to be clean from you, not you clean from me. But the beautiful part of how we recognize what God is saying about washing and cleaning and baptism is that we have something that's been given us that we can make use of you may not know it but you could be a little baby sitting in a high chair with food all over your face and no one come along and clean it off or you could be an adult with baby food all over your face and no one come along and clean it off but God has given us grace which means that he's given us unbelievable favor, unbelievable choice to be on our side and to help us when we don't know we've got baby food all over our face. And he comes along with his grace and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And he wipes off all that that you can't see. But when you look in a mirror, like the Bible, and the Bible is described as a mirror, then you see that baby food and you're able to wash it off because of his grace. Do you see a point there about what Spurgeon is trying to say? God is always going to take care of you and provide for you rivers of living water that you can dive on in and be refreshed, that you could jump on in and be cleansed, that you could splash on in and be washed clean. And that comes from and is developed by simply one thing. you got to read the Bible. I'm sorry, but it's this fountain of living waters. Now, there is a river of life flowing out of you. It does make the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison's doors and says captives free, but it comes from the word of God that is bursting forth out of you, from you putting into you, the Bible itself. So in a devotion and evotion, we steer towards reading and applying the Word of God in us so that when it's time, it comes flowing out of us as rivers of living water to thirsty people. And you can be a fountain of living water. Are you? Or are you the bitter waters of Mara? Which are you? Which do you want to be? Did you know that the bitter waters could be made sweet? And the sweet waters could be made bitter? The choice is yours. I pray that you become a source point and a fountain of gushy, splashy, washy, <laughs> cleansing water that comes up out of your soul, out of your mouth, to another person that shares their need with you. I know for me, that's what happened to me, and it can happen to you. May you be today living waters of Jesus. <laughs>